This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com. And back with us for a part three shoot interview is none other than former WWE wrestler Mario Mancini. How are you doing today? Well, good, brother. Uh, I, I, and eight second Vice TV famous, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, were you on Vice TV? I was. I was on the Nine Lives of Vince McMahon on the Rita Chatterton segment. Oh, okay. Well, that that hasn't aired here in Canada. We don't get Vice, and it's not on YouTube. So oh. maybe you could tell us about your part, and also how was the documentary? Well, well, you know, my part was um, th they took. Uh, a clip from cheap heat with Maurice and I, and, uh, and basically it was the day Rita told me uh, her allegations, you know, back in 86. And, and, uh, that was it. And then, um, you know, they talked about how it all happened and then they showed a, a whole picture of the wrestling school back in 80, 83, actually it was 84. Uh, a whole picture of us in the wrestling school with Rita in there. It was it was a it was a two minute and twenty seven second uh, cover entirely. As far as it as a whole, uh, I I thought it was fair and balanced. If I can if I can steal a a, a, a saying from uh, Fox News, <laughs> I thought it was fair and balanced. Um, listen, uh, you know. Um, I know of Vince McMahon. I worked for Vince McMahon. I've spoken to Vince McMahon. I can, I can, uh, I, I can count on one hand how many times I, I've spoken to him. Um, so I, geez, I, you, not that it's an excuse, uh, but I didn't know the guy's childhood was like that. I, I didn't know he was, you know, sexually abused, and he was raised by um, a, a, a um, abusive stepfather. Um, extremely abusive stepfather and you know he met his biological father when he was 15 years old right got me i didn't know that so um well it was it was uh it was interesting but as i i i said before uh you know a lot of people have a lot of things that happened to them when they were in a, they were a child or in the past, and it might be hard to deal with, but you get help. You go, you go to therapy, you know, um, I think if Vince McMahon ever went to therapy, I, I think that would be the last day that therapist would do that job. They'd probably quit. <laughs> yeah, um, I couldn't imagine that. Uh, so that referee, I guess it came out last week. I saw the article that she sent a demand letter through her lawyer to uh, to Vince, I guess, for wanting over eleven million related to the the alleged uh, sexual assault back in nineteen eighty six. Right, w right. So what had happened was this past November, New York came out with what's called a look back law. So you have until November of 2022 to November of 2023, no matter when it could have been 1962 that you were sexually abused or assaulted or anything like that. And you can bring a claim. Basically what they've done was waive the statute of limitations. So um, that's how she got to bring suit um, in this case. Uh, like I said, I, I stand by what I've said in New York Magazine. I stand by, you know, it, they confirmed that in the Wall Street Journal last week uh, and on podcasts. And the reason why I stand by it is the question posed was, was this communicated to me in 1986? And the answer is yes. Whether the content told to me is true, that's up for, that's up to a judge or a jury or, you know, to decide from the facts whether that's true or not. Now, the, now the point that it was 
communicated to me, my answer is, yeah, it was. That's And that's that's the point of the whole thing. You know what I mean? Um, so, and and then they, they brought um, my brother Greg Valentine into it. And, um, you know, because she, she had mentioned something to him back in like 89. Um, and again, Valentine's probably, he's in the same boat I'm in. He, he, he's like, yeah, she told me that. And, but Valentine blatantly came out and said, I think it's a lie. You know what I mean? I, I don't think it happened. Um, whereas, you know, I, I didn't say that. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. What you asked me is if it was said to me, and my answer is yes, it was. So why did she confide in you of all people, and obviously Greg Valentine too, Uh I guess you guys were friends from working with her and seeing her backstage or something. No. So the, the, the first person she spoke to told was Andre, the giant. Well, Andre is not here anymore. So that left me. The Valentine came up later. That, that was recent. That was only a couple months ago. Um, until then it was just me and Andre and Andre is not here. No, if you look, you can even look on my Facebook handle. I think it's there. There's a group picture, a newspaper took a Tony Altamar, who was our trainer, and the entire wrestling school. So after I was in for a while, you know, I would go back to the wrestling school. If I was off, I'd go back to the wrestling school and I would work in a ring because I was a lunatic. And I couldn't get enough. I, I couldn't get enough. That, and that's why people, that's why Mario Mancini looked the way he did. And they asked me if I have any regrets. And I do. And one of the biggest regret I, I have is not going to like a gold's gym or a world's gym because the ring was in the gym. So I would go in and work out, you know, I'd start doing chest and everything. And then I'd start, you know, I, I'd get halfway done with that. I'd be looking at the ring and looking at the ring and looking at the ring. And before I know, I would drop the weights and I'd be in the ring for two and a half hours. You know, hitting the ropes, going over the top, going over the, going through the middle, hitting the turnbuckles, you know, uh, taking bumps, beals. I, you know, I would, I would just, I, would, I just love the ring. So, you know, that's why Mario looked like Baby Huey. Because if I went to another gym, I would be able to focus on the weights until 1989, when I really took it seriously and I started powerlifting competitively and and taking steroids. So, <laughs> um. So Rita walked in and uh, she said, uh, I, you know, she looked at Tony Altamar and said, I'd, I'd like to be a, a referee. And he's like, wow, that's, there is no female referee. And she's like, yeah, I'd like to do that. And she joined the school and we worked with her and helped Tony train her. So she actually came out of the same school myself came out of, Roma came out of, AJ Petrucci came out of, Dave Barbie came out of. Robbie Parliament came out of, um, Ted Arcidi came out of, um, so, um, you know, that's where she learned. That's how we became like a brother and sister because she came to the same wrestling school, um, that we all went to. So, uh, that, that's, that's how that happened. And, could you share with us what is her version of the story uh, between her and Vince? Was it was it a full uh, intercourse thing or? Well, her story, her words are the the exact story is is this. She was at a diner. And Vince was there at the same diner. They were at different tables, and she wasn't getting that booked that much. And she walked over to talk to Vince about getting more bookings. And Vince had already pumped her up and said, you know, she's going to be on the front, front of cover of Woman's Day and she's going to pay her X amount of dollars. And she's finding herself not booked that much. So she went to go talk about the bookings. And when she went to go talk about her bookings, she, not here. So they ended up leaving the diner and Vince had a limo out there. And the limo driver was in the, still in the diner. And Vince said, well, get in a limo. We'll talk about it. 
So what the limo talked about it and, you know, in her words, he unzipped his pants, took out his gimmick and um, forced her to have oral sex with him. And she didn't complete it. And when she didn't complete it, he got irate and pulled her jeans off and pulled her on top of him until he did. That's her story. Um, you know, and I, uh, shortly after that, I walked into an arena and of course she was there and, you know, I went up to say hello to her. Why wouldn't I, you know what I mean? We're out of the same school and we got close and she just started crying. I said, well, what are you crying for? She goes, I, I wanted to talk to Vince and I got into his limo and I went, oh, tell me you didn't do that. She said it was terrible. And she told me the story. And I said, you're done. You're through. You'll never work again. You're, you're done. Through. And shortly after that, she was gone. So I guess her, her bookings just dried up and she stopped getting booked after that. Yeah. Yeah. She, I told her she was done. All done. I go, you're, you're through. You're, he's not using you anymore. You're done. So she didn't report it to the police right away. She, she actually continued. No. Well, Hannibal, her, her, again, her words, her explanation, you could, you know, you can watch this on Geraldo on YouTube from 1992. Cause that's when she first tr uh, tried to file suit, but the statute of limitations was up. Um, and her reason for waiting so long is that her parents were elderly. And if it got out, they weren't, they weren't well, excuse me. And if it got out, it would certainly kill them. So she didn't want to say anything while her parents was, were, I think it was like two weeks after her last parent passed away. She came out with it. Statue of limitations was blown. Um, Vince countersued her for defamation. But he had other stuff coming up, um, legal stuff coming up, and he dropped the suit. That was the end of it. Now, you mentioned Ted Arcidi was also from your, your school in New Jersey. I saw you wrestle him not too long ago, and I've done an interview with him. He seems like a really nice guy. Any memories of him? Oh, yeah. Listen, Steve Blackman came out of that wrestling school, too. <laughs> so... Um, but yeah, Ted wasn't really ready yet. So um, they wanted him at TV in Poughkeepsie. I was his first match. <laughs> I had to be his first match because I was doing most of the work with him. So I had said to Strongbow, I said, if you want this guy in TV, I, I'm, I got to work with him. I said, yeah, I, I have to call things in there. <laughs> He's not really that ready yet. But Ted, Ted was funny. Oh, what a funny guy. What a nice guy. What a funny guy. You know, Hannibal, there used to be a grocery store across from uh, Pastoral's Quest at the gym. And it was called Edwards Food Warehouse. And he would go there. And I don't know if you've ever seen these. They're a sight to see. It's a can. It's a family size can of Chef Boyardee macaroni and meatballs. Family size can. And he'd have that uh, sitting on the couch in front of the front desk at the gym. And he would just. I go, Ted, what are you doing? He goes, I'm eating cobs. I'm eating cobs. You know, um, he would do neck raises. He'd lay on his stomach on, the, on a flat bench and put a towel around his head. And he would tell me to sit on his head the back of his head with my feet off the floor and he would do neck raises with me on the back of his neck he used to do nose breakers with 315 nose breakers with 315 so i guess his first match would have been in WWE against you then since yeah. you signed he was one of the few back then that would have been signed without any experience just because uh, 
he was huge and a strong man. And I guess they wanted someone to replace Ken Patera because he was in jail, apparently. Oh, well, yeah. Well, here's the here's the deal on that. He wasn't just a strong man. He was he was crowned the strongest man in the world. He he bench pressed seven oh five, in uh, in Hawaii. So he was the strongest man in the world. The fight, you know, he was telling us funny stories about that. Hannibal Kazmaier would call him and leave messages on his answer machine going, You can't do it, you can't do it because he was breaking Kazmaier's record if he did it. So Kazmaier would leave him messages all the time going, You can't do it. Um, so yeah, he was he, he was a great, he was a funny guy, funny guy, just a, just a great guy. I, I was happy to see him. I think he 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 uh, was a boxing promoter in the fighter, the movie The Fighter. I was I I jumped up. I went there's Ted, um, but he he was a good guy. He just he he was a happy go lucky guy, um, and he just he he didn't know the business for a while, you know what I mean? Um, I, I remember Tito trying to work with him loosen to loosen him up. It was as you can imagine, it was very difficult for him to be light while he worked. Um, very difficult because it's just so enormous. Um, but we did the best we could. But as a you know human being, fantastic. He's just a great guy. And you brought up Andre the Giant earlier with uh, the, the referee talking to him. What was his reaction to hearing that news about Vince? He was pissed. Rita told me that he was he was pissed. Um and he he didn't talk to Vince for a little bit, and Vince was very concerned about that. Um, and one of the agents, this is another this is another hearsay story. Um, one of the agents went up to Rita and said, "We'll give you five thousand dollars not to be friends with Andre." So she told Andre, and Andre said, "Go up to them and tell them fifty. Tell them 50,000 and we won't be friends, but we still will be. But tell them 50,000. We just, you know, we won't be friends in public because she got very close to Andre. Um, so, uh, yeah, he w- he wasn't happy about it, you know. Um, and that suit, if it was brought in time in 92, was very, it would have been very crucial if the statue didn't, didn't expire because Andre was still alive. Yeah, he could have testified. Yeah. And as far as Andre, I did see a match with you and Kamala where where Andre came out at the end of it and the crowd went absolutely nuts because I guess that was a more rare thing back then. Now if if someone comes out during a match, you barely hear a peep, but I saw all the fans on their feet and everything. Yeah. Uh, What was it like working with Andre? It was, you know, it, it, I'm I'm a little upset about that video on YouTube because they cut it off because at the end he actually walked me back to the dressing room, and you could just see how enormous the guy was. We we walked side by side back to the dressing room. Andre liked me. He thought I worked hard in the ring, and and I kept I I listened to my second dad Strongbow, and I kept my mouth shut. Um, you know, so I wasn't a guy that was constantly talking in the dressing room and everything. And Andre recognize that so um you know i i I abided by the rules of the business um so uh you know i i got a buddy lou (laughs) he he knows nothing about the wrestling business so he texts me i found this hilarious i don't know if anybody else will but he goes hey mark i go yeah he goes you know i watched this match with kamala and andre came out i go yeah he goes, and then I watched this match with Bad News Brown, and Andre came out again, shook your hand, because before my match with Bad News Brown, Andre had been away making the Princess Bride. So that was his first appearance back to the WWF after he was done with the movie. So before I worked with Bad News Brown, they brought him out. And he came in, shook the referee's hand, my hand. And then, of course, bad news, wouldn't shake his hand. He's a heel, so he wouldn't shake his hand. And Andre left. So my buddy Luke goes, this guy comes out twice, two different matches, and he doesn't help you. What's up with that? 
I don't know, Lou. He just, he goes, he literally just left you there. One time he watched you get beat up. And the other time he just came in and shook your hand and let you, he won't help you. He, he couldn't help you. <laughs> he started laughing. I go, no, Lou, he, he didn't help me. I'm sorry. <laughs> But Andre, um, Andre didn't have a middle road. Andre saw black and white. So um, if he liked you, you were fine. If he didn't, you were screwed. So I'm very, he, he, you, you'd never hear Andre say, he's okay. Mm -mm. No, he either liked you or he didn't. So I was fortunate. Uh, I'll admit I stayed away from him in battle royals. I, I, I don't I don't know. I just didn't want to get hit by Andre. <laughs> Every time I get close to him in a battle royal, I went the other way. <laughs> I went the other way. So I didn't no, I wasn't I wouldn't I, I didn't work with him in battle royals, which would be the only the only opportunity I would have had to um to work with him. So. Yeah, and, and I recently read the the WWE's uh, drug testing policy, and I guess now they have a rule out that you can't consume alcohol within 12 hours of an appearance or an event. Obviously, they didn't have that rule for Andre back then. No, they didn't have that rule for anybody. And, and let me tell you something. I... I um. I, I never seen people so obsessed with beer in my day. I mean, beer was everything. Where's a beer? Where's a beer? Where's a beer? Beer, 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 beer. I mean, they just lived for beer. I think more than weed. I, I mean, they just wanted their beer. You know, I mean, I remember being at a, I remember being at a, uh, a Red Roof Inn in Columbus, Ohio, and a ground round, this restaurant ground round was connected to it. And I was sitting there with Jim Danville Nightheart and Bret Hart at a table and the waitress comes over and Brett orders whatever he orders and Anvil orders a double Jack Daniels. And the waitress looks at me and I said, I'll have a Diet Coke. And then she came back over and, you know, Anvil got another double Jack Daniels and I go, I'll have another Diet Coke. And Anvil looks across to me. He goes, hey, Mancini, don't you drink? I go, no. He goes, you would have never made it in the NFL, ever. I go, good thing I'll play for the NFL. <laughs> but listen, I, I just so, you know, when I tell people I don't drink, they kind of scratch their head and go, oh, I must have had a problem. You know, I tried. And again, on podcasts, I just spill it all. I tried to drink. I tried to drink when I was in high school. Beer was terrible, terrible, so bitter, ter disgusting. Um, I tried to drink wine, doubled over, white and red. I mean, extreme abdominal pains. Um, I've been drunk twice in my life. I'm 56 years old, um, and both times was on. Um, both times was on Jack Daniels. A couple of about four shots of Jack Daniels and I was, I was obliterated. Um, so twice in my life I've been drunk. So I don't, I just don't, it just doesn't appeal to me at all. <laughs> well, consider yourself lucky for that. Josh wants to know how many times have you been pile driven by Paul Orndorff? You know, Josh, it's funny you asked that. Um, there is a video of me working with Paul Orndorff. Uh, and it was requested of me to do a stretcher match. Th th this is a story. Oh, my God. So it was, I think it was before WrestleMania 1, I think. Don't get mad at me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm, I usually have a great memory. Um, I got one fan tore me apart because I was wrong about <laughs> Um, And... My family never came to TV taping. Never. So my brother Bob, who's responsible for Mario Mancini, him and him alone, 
because uh, he paid for my wrestling school. And I was going to do it a year later because I didn't have the money. So he went there the next day and bucked up the money. And, and uh, I got to go to wrestling school right away because of him. So I asked him to come and my mother to Poughkeepsie. <laughs> they were second row on the floor. So Chief comes up to me, he goes, I need you to walk the work with Orndorff. He said, I go, yeah, okay. Because I need you to take a pile driver on the floor to stretch your match. I said, okay. <laughs> what are you going to do, Hannibal? Say no. Take your boots off and go home. I mean, if they said, listen, what, you're going to get a pile driver from Bozo the Clown that he's going to throw confetti all over you. And then he's going to roll you in, in a tar and feather. Yeah, you go, okay. I mean, let's face it. My trunks were pulled over on the side in Canada and Brantford, Ontario. And I got branded by the Funk Brothers on my ass. I mean, what do you, yeah, okay, I'll do the stretcher, you know? And um, yeah, he did a lot. And we, he, we still do love each other very much. Um, so Hannibal, he doesn't throw me on the uh, on any one of the other three sides. He throws me on the side where my brother and my mother in the second floor, the second second row. Gives me the pile driver, and I decided in the dressing room that all the other guys that did stretchers, they would lay with their hands close to their body and their feet together. And I said to myself, you know what? I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to land naturally. I want to, I want to land naturally. I don't want to do that. I really want to sell it well. So he gives me the pile driver on the floor and one leg ends up on the apron. My right leg, my other leg is sprawled out and I'm out cold. I'm out cold. I hear my mother. Oh my God. Oh, my God. My brother gets up, pokes through the first row, leans over, and he's going, Lenny, Lenny. I'm going, this son of a bitch. screaming my real name. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm like, Lenny. I, and he, I had to go like this. Fast. Fast. When I did that, he shut up and he sat down. And then the ring guys came as the medical crew with the white coats and the stretcher and carried me off. Now, with that, I wouldn't get off the stretcher. And and the Poughkeepsie Mid Hudson Civic Center, like I've stated a million times, the hallway is like a mile long before you get to the dressing room. So they're carrying me down the hallway. I get into the dressing room. They carry me all the way out to the other side. I'm out cold on the dress uh, on the stretcher. Will not get up until Strongbow went. Get up, and I got up. When I heard Strongbow say, Be "Why, why, Mario?" Because a couple a couple TV tapings before that, a kid did a stretcher match. He's getting carried down the hallway. Right. There's cops. There's employees. He's getting carried down that long hallway, sits up, jumps off the stretcher and starts walking into the dressing room. Toward the dressing room. Strongbow meets him at the at the counter. He goes, you dumb son of a bitch. God damn you. Get your stuff and get out of here. I'm like, oh, that's not going to happen to me. Mm -mm. No, <laughs> no, I wouldn't get off that stretcher until I heard him say, get up. And when I got up, he hugged me, patted me on the back, and rubbed my head. And he said, good boy. He goes, now listen, this was the first hour. You can't work again for the rest of the night. You're done. So shower, get paid, and you can go home. He goes, it's okay. You don't have to stay. It's better if you don't. So I had the ring guys go get my mother and my brother, and they, me, they met me on the other side of the arena. Um, at, near the exit, the other side where the exit was. And my my brother just looked at me. He goes, are you okay? I went, yeah. He goes, did your head hit the floor at all? I go, no. He goes, you son of a bitch. I said, thank you. 
thank you so much because that means I did my job. If I can sell my own brother, I sold everybody else out there. Thank you for the compliment. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty good story. You you kind of said that when you were done with WWE, it was your choice not to do any more enhancement work and you just went on to your your regular job. So Jeff's asking why you never appeared for WCW. You know, what what is this the Hannibal Mario Mancini regret show? <laughs> Jeff, is that what this is? Well, let me tell you something, Jeff. I got out of the WWE F three months before my 26th birthday, I was 25. So I entered six weeks after my 18th birthday on July 31st of 1984. My, my birthday is June 21st. I graduated high school, June 20th, turned 18, June 21st, turned pro July 31st, 84. I had a bad attitude. I would have loved to go to the WCW. I wasn't asked to go to the WCW. That's the only other place I would have went. In 1990, Brett asked me to go to Calgary. And I said, no. I said, I've been here for six years. He goes, yeah, and you're getting killed, and it's not going to get any better. Go to Calgary. I said, you're going to guarantee I'm coming back. Very nice of him to offer. Because I said, I'm going to go there. Your father's going to break my arm. I got to ride on the bus for 14 hours. I go, you couldn't ask me in 86 when I was only in for a couple of years. I've been here for six years. You're asking me now if I want to go to Calgary. I had an attitude. And this was my attitude, Jeff. I am a huge baseball fan. Huge. That was my first dream to play for the New York Yankees. My second dream was to be a pro wrestler. My first dream was to be a major league baseball player. And I had the mentality when I got out of the WWF that if I went to an independent circuit, it was like I got, I got demoted to triple A. I couldn't get that out of my head. There I was playing for the Yankees, although I, I was a utility guy, right? I was a utility guy for the WWF. But, you know, I have a T-shirt on pro wrestling tees that says, yeah, I'm a jobber for the biggest effing company on the, on the planet, right? So I, I felt like I, I got demoted to AAA and I couldn't get that out of my head. Now, the Guardian of Chaos, Big Daddy, he's right. He goes, you're full, Mario. You could have got great paydays. He goes, you, you could have made great money on the independent circuit. You just got off the TV. And he's right. He's, he's right. He's right. Um, but I didn't. I just couldn't get that out of my head that I was demoted to AAA. I, I just, plus, I had a bad experience. I had bad experiences at independent pro wrestling. So what do I mean by that? I mean, Killer Kowalski would call the office for talent for his shows in Massachusetts. And he'd sound like me and SD, Myron Mike Sharp. And we walk into the dressing room and you, you get the dirty look. Oh, here they come. Oh, they're better than us. Oh, here come the WWF guys. I just didn't like the way it made me feel. You know, it's like, you know, I respect anybody that gets between those ropes. Anybody who enters that ring, even a wrestling student, any one of my wrestling students, I have, I, I have high respect for it because you really are risking your life going into that ring, and you better damn well know what you're doing when you go in there. So anybody who's got the guts to go in there, I respect, no matter if you're an independent pro wrestler, WWE, AEW, anybody who enters that ring, I have respect for. You know, but it's, I didn't like the feeling I got when we used to get leased out to independent companies. You know what I mean? They'd pay the office a fee, and then the office would pay us whatever, usually two fifty, and um, then they probably got seven fifty a piece for us or a grand. They gave us two fifty, but um, I just didn't like the feeling, and I couldn't get that out of my head that I was getting demoted to AAA. I, I was like, I was wrestling, I was playing for the Yankees, and now. I got to go and wrestle for the Mississippi Mudslingers or something. 
I just couldn't get it out of my head. Um, but it was a dumb move, and I, I you know, I should have kept going. Plus, I, I just got engaged, and I had met my daughter when she was three and a half. At that point, she was six. I adopted her when she was seven. You know, she's my daughter. Um, and she's 37 years old now, so she's mine. And, you know, I didn't want to I, – I wanted to be home. You know what I mean? I wanted to be home. So I tooled around for a couple of years, and then I went to college in 94, and then after college I ended up going to law school. So, you know, I, I – I should have, though. I should have. Michael wants to know that if uh, you were considered one of the boys in, in WWE or did they treat the enhancement talent like outsiders, you were a regular, so I could see how you'd be treated different than someone coming in once or twice. Well, Michael, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, it took me about two years. Two years. Um I, uh, you know, when I first started my first year um, taping in Poughkeepsie, you know, I got I got dressed pretty close to the showers. Um, you know, my bag was always wet and everything. It took it took a couple of years to and and some hazings, you know, chops until in battle royals until my chest, you know, opened up. Um, my brother. My loving brother, and I, I mean that sincerely, David Schultz broke my nose in two places in West Warwick, Rhode Island on August 9th, 1984. Um, so happy he did that. That 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 uh that saved me a lot of more hazing. Um it, it took a couple of years and before I got accepted, before I I can speak to them and we were talking on the same level. Um so and I was getting treated no differently than than they were being treated, you know. Um, and by the time I was in, um, you know, six seven years, then you know my mouth was going, and you know, you know all this other stuff. And and it, 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 you're right. When somebody comes in for the first time, or they're there one or one or two times. And, you know, I, I didn't do anything to make them feel any more comfortable because that's what I went through. If I went through it, you have to go through it. That's the wrestling business. Um, that's the way it is. You have to pay your dues and you have to earn your respect. You just don't get it right off the bat. So, um, yeah. In, in fact, I look at Valentine at conventions and I go, you know, we, we should have been this close back then. You know, and you'd go, well, it was a different time back then. You know, I, in Poughkeepsie, there was this big dressing room big room and on the left side of it were two rooms and those rooms had couches and sofas in it and and recliners whereas outside of those rooms in the big room there were metal chairs so i was in about six months and i said screw it i'm going into one of those rooms i'm gonna go and get dressed in there i don't care i'm going in there so i sat down and started putting my boots on and stuff and all of a sudden i saw feet in front of me and I looked up and it was Valentine and he went hey I said hi he goes leave took my stuff took my bag I was gone <laughs> I was gone you know and uh you know but after a while I mean this is how God God blessed me this is how good I have it I was in Baltimore, Maryland, at a wrestling convention, and Ted was late, DiBiase, and he's walking by the tables, and he's on a hey, hey, Ted, he's on a hey, a hey, a hey, walking to his table, so he goes to walk by mine. I go, Ted, hey, I go, yeah, I know you're not walking by me like that, and he looked, him, oh, she's Mario, <laughs> and the guy I was with, my buddy, I was with my brother Kevin Saban. That I brought along with me, and he always tells that story, man. He loves that story that Ted just stopped dead in his tracks, you know, because I broke the record with DiBiase. While DiBiase's tenure in the WWE, um, nobody's worked more with him than me. I've done the most appearances on TV as as a jobber with Ted DiBiase than than anyone. So Ted and I got really close. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I think Ted has maybe my highest viewed shoot interview of 2022 too. So uh, I suggest fans check that out. Did you have a favorite arena to wrestle in? You got to wrestle in some of the, the greatest arenas in the time you were in WWE. Uh, obviously, the New Haven Coliseum was very dear to my heart uh, because it was only six miles from my house. And when they announced me there, it was deafening. That was the when I worked there was my only Hulk Hogan moments because they they just went nuts because I was from Milford, Connecticut, and there it is sitting in New Haven, Connecticut. Right? Uh, I got one of my only three wins in New Haven, <laughs> and uh, it was actually September eleventh, nineteen eighty six, against Gino Carabello, and it was a fluke. So I I'd called Gino and I said, hey, you want to go to New Haven tonight to hang around with the boys? He went, yeah, I go, let's go have some fun, man. So I walked in at six o'clock and and Arnie just dropped his head and put his hands on in, on his knees. And I go, Arnie, what's wrong? He goes, the, they're all on the same plane. The plane's late. They're not coming in until a half hour after the show starts. I need 30 minutes. I need you guys to get dressed and I need 30 minutes. I go, I'm 20 years old. I'm like, okay you know and um he goes what do you have for a finish I went, mm. <laughs> <laughs> i said i got a reverse flying body press off the second rope he goes use it i go okay again that night i made the rounds with my whole family anybody want to come anybody because i get free tickets anybody want to come anyone i get comps no Nah, are you working? No, nah, I'm just going to say hello. No, nah, we don't want to go. Okay. So um, that was that was a great moment. You know, I, I remember the match so vividly because um, we we needed to do 30 minutes. So I had Gino do the the jacket routine as the heel. You know, I had him, you know, kind of Chippendale-ish kind of. The whole place started whistling. He put the jacket back on, tell him, kick the bottom rope, tell him to shut up. Then he'd plant himself in the middle of the ring like this. We would try to take the jacket off again. They all come up. He'd slam his hands on the top rope, lean over, go up on the second rope. Keep your mouth shut when I'm taking my jacket off. I'm like, this is good. This is about four minutes now. So, um, you know, the third time he just whipped it off and then the bell rang and then we squared off against each other. I said, Gino, spit right at me. And he and he goes, Poo, spits right out. I go run and he goes underneath the bottom rope. I go chasing him or we're running around the ring, running around the ring, running. We're running down the aisle. I'm trying to get him. He runs back into the ring. I'm running after him. You know, we, we killed a good 10 minutes before we even laid a hand on each other. So, so it was a, it was a really good match. Uh, the referee came in at about, I don't know, I'd say about 26 minutes, even though the internet's wrong. Boy, did that make me angry. Uh, in fact, well, yeah, the internet, it was, somebody's got it on there. Like it was a, it, like a, an 11-minute match. I'm like, are you out of your mind? No way. <laughs> like, so uh, the ref came in at about, I don't know, 23 minutes, and he went, everybody's here, take it home. And, you know, he stopped me, slammed me, gave me one buckle, went to go give me the other buckle. I got up on the second rope, came back with that reverse flying body press, boom, boom, boom. When Howard Finkel announced my name, I was three feet from him, Hannibal, and I tell you, I couldn't hear him. I couldn't even hear him announce my name. That's how loud it was. It was all, the building was shaking. It was one of the greatest moments I, I experienced. Other than that, I wrestled Tony Atlas in Madison Square Garden. Another fluke. They were short. Because uh, you're not going to, you know, Mancini's not going to the garden too often, you know. Uh, I like the Philadelphia Spectrum because that's where Rocky was filmed. <laughs> you know, so there were, there were, uh, there were a few arenas I enjoyed working in. In in the mid '80s, did they go to Madison Square Garden in Philadelphia monthly or twice yes. a month? Okay. Monthly, yeah. Wow, hard to believe that now it's like three or four times a year, and it's not even sold out most of the time. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, it was it, the Garden was every month. 
every month. Patrick wants to know if you have any memories of, of Barry O, who I believe is Randy Orton's uncle, that that never really got a push. It, you know, I, I um, Barry O and I got along very well in the dressing room. Um, obviously, he was in my position, so I really never uh, – I didn't – have an opportunity to work with them in the ring ever. Um, but you know, he was a good guy, um, in the dressing room, you know, just, just one of the boys, you know, I don't have anything. Um, no, I don't, I don't remember that being August 13th. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't have any outside the wrestling business kind of stories or anything like that. Or it was just basically in the dressing room. Truth be told, the guys who smoked, I kind of, I kind of tried to stay away from because it was (laughs) him and his brother smoked like a stack. Yeah. I think Randy Orton smokes too. I, I remember seeing him backstage with, uh, the, the nicotine pen, but I hear that that he smokes weed too, but we'll just pay the fine because apparently it's just a fine for weed in, in WWE. So he might have inherited that habit. Um, but you were on Tuesday night Titans with Vince McMahon, who we talked about earlier and it was rare for enhancement enhancement talent to be on there, but that was a popular show back then. How did that whole situation come about? Wow. You're hitting really good stories, man. <laughs> Again, it's going to make me, you're going to feel bad for me, I hope, but it's going to make me look like a jerk. So I walk into Poughkeepsie and Howard Finkel goes, Mario? I said, yeah. He goes, we need you to land over Maryland next Tuesday. I go, for what? He goes, and this is, I mean, this is April or May of, of 85. Um, maybe it was after I worked with Bundy. That was in March of 85. Um, so it had to be April or May. So I wasn't even in a year yet. So Finkel goes, we need you in Landover, Maryland on Tuesday. I go for what? He goes, Tuesday night Titans. I go, really? He went, yeah. So I kind of couldn't feel my leg. So I sat down and I went, it happens this fast? I'm I'm going to be a superstar that fast. It happens that fast. They must really like me. Wow. I'm, I'm going on Tuesday Night Titans. Holy mackerel. I'm going to be a star. Jesus, I wonder what they have in store for me. Pete Thority comes up to me, he goes, hey, Mario. He goes, hey, you going to land over next Tuesday? I go, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll see you there. I'm going to. Lombardi comes up to me. Hey, you going to land over? I go, aha. Uh-huh. Rusty Brooks. Love Rusty. I go up to Rusty, I go, you want to land over Maryland next Tuesday? He goes, yeah, you going? I go, uh-huh. So I go back up to Finkel and I go, hey, Howard, what's it about? He goes, oh, it's the unsung heroes of wrestling, the losers. Okay. And there went the dream. <laughs> There went the dream. So Roma came, um, you know, and, and and I tried. I was so nervous. I mean, I'm the one sitting closest to Vince. He puts up a clip of me working with Bundy. You know, I, I said a lot a lot of more things than the, they edited it out because I, I had actually had said to him, you know, Vince, I go by your by your commentary that one wrong move by any of these guys. And my career shoot skyrockets. So, because he asked me, 
what goes through my mind to agree to sign a contract to wrestle a guy named like King Kong Bundy. And that was my answer to him. You know what I mean? But that didn't make it. So I, I did make sure I said, you know, I'm 18 years old. I wanted the fans to know how young I was because I was the youngest guy in the WWE then. And I was even younger than the Tonga kid. So, um, you know, it, it, after that, they had a little get together with this, this, um, comedian we played rock'em sock'em robots and um you know it was a fun it was a fun time um so it was a fun time and i'll just throw this one in because it's a simple question before we get on to the lombardi story uh what is your diet like today obviously uh you, you were telling us last time you were a good cook i haven't eaten yet so uh don't go too much into the details of your cooking ability, but has it changed much over the years? Well, it, it, it has. I mean, I am, I'm an outstanding cook and I can, I can thank my father for that. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm an even a better baker, uh, believe it or not. I, I, I have a hobby where I, I make 46 different kinds of cheesecakes. Um, but my diet has changed dramatically uh, since, one of my nine years uh because nine years ago um i ate anything that came across the table there's i think in 2011 um i'm 257 now in 2011 i blew up to 316 pounds um i ate anything that came across the table and it was when i was 47 years old nine years ago where the skin on the side of my feet, it, it felt really rough. And at the time I was married and my wife was like, just need to put some cream on there. I think it'd be okay. But what I didn't know was that was the beginning of, of diabetic neuropathy. My nerves were dying in my feet and I didn't know it. And I, I didn't know I was pre-diabetic. Uh, and uh, I had went to Disney with my, I took my kids to Disney Um met Jimmy Larritz there at Animal Kingdom. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> uh, he used to be a catcher for the Yankees. Um, and I was very fatigued. And my mother-in-law was like, well, maybe you're getting sunstroke or something. And I was eating all this Disney food. And my sugar must have been like 400. <laughs> so I was going into um, hyperglycemia. And I didn't know it because I didn't know I was diabetic. So, uh, and in other words, I have type two diabetes. So, um, it's and it's 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 hard. I'm trying to lose weight. It's hard to lose weight with the medication I'm on, but I'm 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 giving it hell. So, you know, my diet. I I usually have either two whole eggs in the morning, or <clears throat> I'll do um, I'll do eight egg whites. Um, you know, I'll just I'll just put some turkey breast or chicken breast over a salad in the afternoon and uh at night i'll eat some ground turkey you know I'll, I'll either mix that with hot sauce and and put some pasta zero in it it's mushroom pasta um you know it's late at night that kills me man because i got i gotta stop buying it it's the 647 bread it's um high fiber low carb bread you know, I, the only thing is, is I, I, I have a very difficult time in moderation. That's my problem. You know what I mean? So I can buy a loaf of bread and it'll be gone in like two and a half days. And well, that's low carb bread. And, you, you know, I'll just put sugar free jelly on it or, or you know, uh, I'll make a turkey sandwich on it and whatever. And, and if I'm really, really busy. Um, which a lot of times I am, unfortunately, I, I, with my job on the road and everything, I'll, I'll, I'll go get a, a, a Whopper, a double Whopper and a plate. I'll go get a Big Mac and a plate, <laughs> you know, without the bread, you know. Um, so, but but then, you know, if I go to a restaurant, I'll convince myself that the chicken wings are okay because there's no carbs in it, but there's a lot of fat in it. And everything. To, to put it to rest, I just, I just got my numbers like uh, maybe six weeks ago and, uh, my cholesterol is good. My A1C is 6.3 and the liver, kidneys, everything's good. So my numbers are good. So I'm happy with that. That's good. Sounds like you might be more healthy than me. Uh, but let's get into the uh, Brooklyn Brawler, Steve Lombardi story. 
you said you were going to tell us it on this podcast before Christmas to kind of end the year. Uh, we recently had him on, on this show. You didn't come up, but I guess you, you had some heat with him at one point. Well, here's the situation. And I want it, I I want it to be known now since I got it off my chest. Um, after all these years, you know, Hannibal, and you you seem to be the same stand-up guy. In in my opinion, you're the same stand-up guy. So say we had heat again with each other. And for years, we just bad-mouthed each other. Now, there's guys out there that will, will come face-to-face together one day and go, hey, how you doing? Hmm. You seem to be like a stand-up guy like me. The, the heat will still be there. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like you're not putting that face on just because you're meeting in person. Um, I had a lot of hard feelings over the past 30 years because we were in the same position. The same position. He was Steve Lombardi. I was Mario Mancini. One day I walked into the dressing room and and that's the worst job I ever did. I had to do a job for him. I walked in the dressing room and he had the hat, he had the torn Yankee sweatshirt, the cigar, and I said, the chief, I go, what's that? What is that? What? Mind your business. I go, no, no. What is that? Where's my gimmick? I'm not a better worker than I am. No way. I'm not a better wrestler. I could talk on a microphone. Give me something. What is that? Chief, what is it? Finally, he took me aside and he said, you want to pay those dues? I said, "Mm mm-mm, shut up. Okay. So I was mad for years, for years, because I tried to make it on my talent. So now I'm in Baltimore. Was it Baltimore or was it Pennsylvania? Jersey. I think it was Jersey. That's where I had my brother Kevin with me. And I was talking to him, looking to the left, and I looked forward, and Lombardi was standing right in front of my table staring at me and I went he went you don't even remember me do you I go oh no I remember you Lombardi oh I remember did you have a good career it was good did you make a lot of money did you have a great career Steve I'm so happy for you he goes what's the problem I go what's the problem I go you were better than me you're better than me no no, I had Strongbow. I had Strongbow. You had Patterson. Standing behind you, giving you a push. And it, Hannibal went. <laughs> I said, I didn't have that. And he said, Pat, you know, Pat hurt me more than helped me. I said, how dare you say that about that man now that he's dead? How dare you say that? So I got everything off my chest. Somebody came up and interrupted him and talked to him while he was in front of my table. And Kevin looked at me and went, bro, you hammered the shit out of him. I go, yeah. He goes, he goes, I go, what do you want me to let it go? Yeah. He goes, "Eh." you said everything you had to say, right? I go, yeah. He goes, oh, bro, come on. You know, Kevin's one of those. He's, he's, he is the quintessential father, husband. He's got great kids, strong marriage, years. That guy. Let it go. So the guy walks away from Lombardi and. I get up from my table and I go around to him and I put my arms out. I go, come on, Steve. 
And he came in and we hugged and he, he said in my ear, he goes, what was I supposed to do? Don't give it to me, give it to Mario. I go, no, Steve, that's not the point. But if it, it's okay, man. Sorry, congratulations. Congratulations. Then after the convention was over, Scott Wilder took us out to eat. His crew, me, Roma, and Tugboat, the people that he hired to go there. And um, Lombardi was leaving the restaurant. He goes, was it okay that I ate here, Mario? Is that okay with you? <laughs> I, said, I said, Steve, everything's good now. And everything is good now. You know what I mean? I always liked Steve. He was a good guy. I, and I'll say this about him. Um. I, you know, I love professional wrestling. I, I you know, I, I'm still, I'm not doing it. I'm still teaching it. I have my own company, Paradise Alley, but he loved it too, man. I mean, he, it was his whole life and he ended up staying with the office for 30 years and really lived his dream. And, and that's, you know, that's fine. I'm good with him now. I, Lombardi's, he, you know, I never had a problem with him or anything like that. It's just, I just really had sour grapes, man. I was mad. It was bad. Well, and I, I understand that Patterson, his friendship probably helped him, but but as he told me off the air, uh, he has all those rumors about him and, and Patterson that he's got to deal with that I don't think he likes, whether they're true or not, but, but we don't hear about those type of rumors with you. But la last question here, uh, just a quick one, because I know you don't smoke weed. But no, Fester. <laughs> No, Fester, the last time I smoked weed was 1983 before Eddie Murphy concert, and I passed out and sweat right through my clothes because it was tie stick, and I didn't know what it was, and I never smoked it again. So next year will be my 40th anniversary. I, uh, you know what? I, I, I will do do an edible because my body hurts, but I'll never smoke it. But I, I do. I'll, I'll eat a half a cookie here and there. <laughs> Just watch out for the drinks because they can uh, really mess you up, as I unfortunately found out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you you got a wrestling school in Paradise Valley Wrestling, the wrestling league that I think you and Paul Roma run. Where yeah, pa find Paradise, out more Paradise Alley, Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling uh, in East Haven, Connecticut. Um you know, we, we just got a boatload of new students came out of nowhere. And I couldn't believe it. In this economy, we're so thankful. Um, you know, so uh, really, really happy that it's it's going strong. We just had a show last night. And um, we just had a show last night. Went really well. And, and uh, yeah, we're, we're just, Roma and I are just chugging along. <laughs> Love Roma. <laughs> yeah, and I think that answers the question. How is he nowadays? Uh, he's doing great. Let me tell you something. Roma's 62. He looks like he's 42. He wears that cutoff shirt that cutoff shirt at the, the school when he's teaching. And I go, Are you ever gonna get small? Is it ever gonna happen? Are you ever gonna lose these biceps? And he just starts laughing. You know what I mean? He's just a, you know, another good family guy. You know, has a, a tremendous family, tremendous daughter, excellent athlete. What a shock. Uh, World-class gymnast. Um, one day going to have national recognition. What a shock. You know what I mean? The genetic, genetics she has. So um, I, I don't know. I've seen him bench 440. You know, I've seen him deadlift 500 like it was 125 pounds. I, I don't, you know, but, um, but yeah. So, well, it's good to know that, that everything's going well. And I wish your, your school and company a lot of success heading into 2023. Thank you for the th uh, three shoot interviews you've done with us this year. And I'll let you close this off with whatever you want to tell the fans. Well, this is what I want to tell the fans. This year, as well as last year and the year before have been pretty tough years been kind of hard um thank god gas prices are starting to come down a little bit but the food prices are still pretty much soaring and i know it's very hurtful this time of year because we're literally a week away from christmas eve but still 
not 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 to withstand all that stuff. I want everybody to have a very happy holiday, whether it's Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa. Have a safe New Year, and um, to uh, a very special friend in uh, Brazil, Itiamo Angelini. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, guys. Have a good Thank one. you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos.